all pretty excited around here. Um, we also have offices in Nashville and Atlanta. Um, want to start with a bit of housekeeping today. Um, we will be sending out the recording and the materials after the event. Um, no, we do not offer CEUs. You'll notice in the webinar that there's a box uh, for chat, and if you have any questions, we'll be holding some time at the end uh, to get those questions to our panelists. Uh, with that, I just wanted to give a brief uh, commercial on Stroudwater Associates. Uh, we are a leading national healthcare consulting firm. We work exclusively with healthcare clients. We focus on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our prospectus offers the highest value. We have 34 years uh, track record with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. Uh, now to uh, short bios on our presenters today. Uh, Jeff Summer is the firm's managing director. Uh, previously, he was the leader of Stroudwater's affiliations and partnerships and capital planning and access service lines. For more than 25 years, he's focused on assisting clients with strategic initiatives, including planning and executing major capital projects, analyzing strategic options, crafting innovative affiliations, and executing business development opportunities. Our next presenter today is in our Nashville office. Doug Johnson is the co-practice leader for the firm's affiliations and partnership practice. He's an accomplished healthcare professional and joined Stroudwater in 2014 with more than 20 years in transaction, business development, and financial accounting experience. We have a Stroudwater alumni with us today. Um, Scott Goodseed was formerly a consultant with Stroudwater and still serves as an advisor. He is currently the program director for the Executive Master of Healthcare Leadership at Brown University. Prior to going to Brown, Scott worked as president and CEO for four hospitals in three states and has deep industry experience and a national repu reputation in governance. With that, uh, we will get going with the presentation, and Doug Johnson in Nashville will kick us off today. Doug? Thank you, Kimberly. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you might be listening. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and I'm especially appreciative of the opportunity to collaborate with two of my colleagues, Jeff and Scott. Um, like to spend just a, a, a few minutes um, to review and revisit just a couple of very high-level industry trends and challenges uh, that make good management and governance structure even more important uh, as, we move, as we move forward. Um, we all know that patients are, over the last couple of years, have really had to start behaving more like consumers. Uh, because they're now carrying a heavier financial responsibility for their care. Um, and when you look at covered workers in these employer-sponsored plans, uh, in addition to their usual and, and increasing premiums, they're also responsibility, responsible for more and more of a deductible. You see on the left-hand side of the, the chart there that 85% or so uh, of, of covered workers now have a, a have a, a deductible. Um, I saw recently a publication that, that noted that in 2018, uh, the median in-network de in deductible was about $1,500 for an employee-only plan and, and over $3,000 for a family plan. So, you know, for, for healthcare providers, uh, the greater patient responsibility means more financial risk. Essentially, people now are shopping for care and unfortunately, in some cases, deferring their care, which means that they're going to present uh, at your in your organizations in, in even sicker than than before. We also continue to see pretty significant uh, reimbursement headwinds, uh, especially as it pertains to Medicare margins. Uh, with baby boom as the baby boomers continue to age into Medicare eligibility, um, and as the 
uh, as Medicare and CMS as, as, Medis, as CMS continues to expand enrollment in the Medicare Advantage plans, you really need to be able to survive uh, in a Medicare world. Um, this chart is expected to be updated uh, soon by MedPAC, uh, but most everyone would uh, are ex are expecting to see that in 2018 that negative margin somewhere around 11%. So Medicare margins are expected to continue their decline uh, into the future. The hospital closure epidemic continues to be a recurring event. Uh, it's it's really gotten to it's 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 getting to the point now where it's it almost isn't front page news anymore. Um, you know, it, hospitals that are reluctant to embrace. Uh, new care models, uh, reluctant to embrace new payment methodologies, are going to find themselves in very challenging situations. Uh, I thought it was, I, I, you know, it's not just the rural hospitals that are struggling with this. I, if you look at the table on the bottom right-hand corner, um, it's, it's an equal distribution between rural facilities and, and urban hospitals. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not just the, the, the small rurals that are that are, are particularly challenged. There we go. Um, the credit rating agencies like Moody's and S&P, um, who are the lifeblood for, of, of capital access for, for the not-for-profit hospitals, um, they are not bullish on near-term operating results. Uh, you know, they expense growth uh, for for the non -pro for the not for profit public hospitals continues to outpace revenue growth. I I think in a lot of cases hospitals are doing a good job of fixing their cost structures, um, but you can't you can't cut your way to prosperity. Um, the shift to uh, you know it, it's it's difficult to find volume growth to offset a lot of the the uh, reimbursement declines. Um, when, when most of the growth, when more and more services are migrating to, out of the acute care setting and into a more cost-effective ambulatory care setting. Um, so many of the credit agencies, the, the credit rating agencies, expect to see uh, more contraction in, in hospital margins, which is going to make it even more difficult uh, to, to participate. So layer on top of a lot of the more traditional industry challenges, let's add some disruptors to the existing pressures. Um, I think most everyone is, is, is familiar with the CVS Aetna uh, arrangement. Um, and, in, and Walmart is involved with, with is in, in, a, in a more significant way in healthcare, Walgreens and others. Um, and, and most of these organizations are focused on primary care and, and preventative care. The, um, so Larry Merlot, who is the, the CVS CEO, his comment recently was that they want to create a new front door uh, to American healthcare. Um, and their real focus is on medical services that keep patients healthy. I mean, you know, they, they have 9,700 plus stores, which all have pharmacies. Uh, they have over a thousand minute clinics across the country. Uh, and now they have claims data. Uh, through their through their arrange through their merger with with Aetna, so they are well positioned uh, to provide preventative to, to to do their best to try to prevent unnecessary hospital care uh, and working to prevent readmissions uh, and essentially working to to help people manage their care um, and the medical care business is going to come down to uh, who can better deliver medical care in the right place. And at the right time and in the right amount. So it's becoming more and more important that an effective senior management team, collaborative government governance amongst the the board and 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 the the district boards, municipal municipal boards, uh, in this new age of healthcare, it's 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 becoming more and more important. Let me um let me toss it now to Scott, who will who will focus on best governance practices. Thanks, Doug. I'm going to talk about warning signs, some um, governance fundamentals, as well as um, board best uh, practices. 
Hey, Scott, it's Kimberly. Would you like me to queue yeah. up a poll? Why don't we go ahead sure. and do that? Um, we have a poll. How serious are your governance challenges? And I'm going to launch that right now. You should see that on your screen. How serious are your governance challenges? Uh, not at all. Moderate, severe. We'll keep that open while we're tabulating. Um, solidly in the middle at moderate so far. A few at severe. A few more seconds while people answer. And we're going to close the poll. Um, it came out 20% uh, said they're not having any problems at all. 70% say moderate governance issues. And 10% say severe. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you. So oftentimes, uh Governance structure, especially for county and district-owned hospitals, creates challenges as shown in the next couple of examples. So the, the first example is a recent example where you had a board of managers at Messina, New York, Memorial Hospital, threatens to sue the town government of Messina, which, which owns the hospital, for firing the incoming board chairwoman, and the hospital and the town refuting over a proposed merger and after after the town fired the <clears throat> the chairwoman the hospital's law firm said it would uh, challenge the move these are the kinds of situations we want to avoid at all costs these kinds of conflicts it's poor governance and it's certainly not good for the community and it's certainly not good for the patients so this is not an isolated incident in the next few examples um, there's an example where the taxpayers end up uh, paying for the hospital board mistakes. Uh, there's a question about dual and joint oversight. And then there's a question about transparency. You can see in 2017 in the Gainesville Daily Register, um, there's a question about the, uh, the legal structure that includes two boards. Um, in this case, it's a county board and a, and a hospital board with a group and jury in this case finds that the hospital can't account for the taxpayer dollar. So the hospital district operated in a difficult to understand legal structure is a public district in this case, of course, but also a 501c3 nonprofit hospital. And according to the grand jury, a total of two supervisory boards were exercising oversight, which led to great public confusion. And then in a, in a recent article in the Daily Sentinel, um, you can see the example of Memorial Hospital's financial problems have been allowed to fester um, in the darkness or at least in the shadows for far too long, um, where the constituents of the hospital's governing board, governing board have the right to understand what's going on financially. So these are not just a few isolated examples. Hey, I'm gonna Scott. share with you next, yes. I'd like to um, interject a poll here again just to see how what you just reported on um, in public debate, how that resonates with our group. Um, so I'm going to yes. launch a live poll. How often do your governance issues play out publicly? Um, that could be community members, media, anywhere where it goes beyond the boardroom and, and the four walls of your facility. We're collecting responses right now. Um, solidly, ooh, we're up at more than 60%, say, sometimes. A few more seconds here. Got a lot of activity on this one. Seems to be a popular topic. All right, we're going to close this out. And 20% um, say that it never goes outside the boardroom. 65%, that's stunning, say that it does spill out into the community and the media, and 15% say it frequently does. So sometimes and frequently you've got uh, representation of 80%. Thank you, Scott. So I want to talk a little bit about the early warning signs um, that may signal that uh, um, your governance may be headed for trouble. Um, and I say, I say maybe, but let's also understand when we think about the last poll, 
um, typically a, a public hospital district county um, is uh, the minutes are open to the public, sometimes the board meetings are open to the public, and sometimes in a legal sense. But I want to talk about three things I want you to um, want you to think about in terms of three warning signs. The, the first category relates to the role of the hospital board and the county and district board. The second category relates to the alignment of the interest of both groups. And the third category relates to leadership and, and decision making. And I wanna take one of them at a, at a time. So when we think about the role of the hospital board and the county and district board, um, if there's a lack of clarity as it relates to decision rate rights, if there appears to be an inherent conflict among the people um, who govern those two organizations, those structures, or among the issues, um, it could be an early warning sign. Um, worse than that, if there's inherent conflict um, among the people who are governing versus the issues, that's even more significant. If it seems like the governance is about power and control, or there's poor communication between the two boards, um, and even more so if the roles and responsibilities are not clearly understood or not written, um, that raises a red flag for um, many boards. The, the second category is alignment of interest. So, alignment of the of the financial needs of the community in terms of the district as well as the um, as well as the county um, alignment about the issue of um, taxation um, alignment about what's the vision what's the per preferred future we saw in the first example in New York um, perhaps there was there was a vision about a merger consolidation but not about the objectives and how to work effectively through that. Now, if there's a lack of board job descriptions at the county and district level, as well as the hospital level, that's a red flag in my mind because we wanna be clear about the responsibilities. <clears throat> and there also should be an understanding of the role of the CEO as it relates to the hospital board, as well as the county or the district board. And then, Third um, thing I think you need to consider relates to leadership and decision making. <clears throat> I think where governance works well in these kinds of um, structures is where there's a level of personal trust, where sometimes the board members will spend time outside of the routine governance that could be um, um, internal education, external education, um, where there's, there's um, um, some, the structure becomes burdensome. Um, and again, it's not clear who's doing what. Um, oftentimes there's no overlap in the governance. Sometimes there's some shared governance, which I would, I would give some thought to. Um, there could be questions in terms of how do you translate board decisions at both levels into um, effective action? And then the question is, who drives the change? And I'm going to come back and talk about that. And given what Doug said earlier about the level of disruption, who begins to think about innovation and how we may have to change as a community organization to effectively position or perhaps even reposition ourselves? So I have a suggestion. A simple thing to do is to take these three warning signs um, and have both of the boards rate their effectiveness. So both boards rate their effectiveness on a scale of one to five in these three categories, just to get a sense of whether you're trending um, in the direction of some moderate or significant governance issues. Next, I wanna talk about six board or governance fundamentals to consider. Um, the, the, the first relates to the future of the hospital, the future of the healthcare system, and does the district and the county, as well as the local board, have an understanding of what that future looks like over the next couple of years, given whatever the objectives 
of the healthcare organization may be. The, the second thing, which I know you all do and consider, is, is a, um, a prerequisite to ensure the quality of the clinical care and the patient experience. Sometimes that can filter its way to the uh, community newspaper in the form of an isolated story. Um, but again, that's a, that's a local board responsibility. The third fundamental is to protect the health of the organization as well as the county and the district. So unlike one of those cases we heard earlier, um, and most of you are required to do this, I suggest that, that you be transparent, that you monitor the income statement and the balance sheet. Um, if you begin to see some erosion on the balance sheet side, the red flag goes up, but it's not a, a surprise to the district, it's not a surprise to the local board, and it's not a surprise to the, to the community. The, the fourth governance fundamental is to um, ensure effective executive leadership. So the first priority of the, of the community hospital board is to hire and evaluate the, the CEO, and I think that's, that's pretty clear. Number five is to develop, improve, and perpetuate an effective governance system. And I mean three things by that. First is I believe there should be term limits. Depending on what the local um, laws are as it relates to the district and county, but certainly within the, um, the hospital or healthcare organization, um, there should be effective orientation for um, new board members, um, district or county um, board members, as well as hospital board members. And then I think it's absolutely vital for both organizations, if they haven't done it, both boards to sit down and, and delineate their roles and responsibilities. And I'll give you an example of that. And then finally, number six, is to reflect the community serve and to strengthen the relationship, um, not only with the community, but with the medical staff, um, as well as the employees and the patients that you, you serve. Next, I'm gonna talk about eight best governance practices. And the first is, is understanding current reality. So that's both from a qualitative and a quantitative assessment. Um, Stroudwater is known for that. Um, so you wanna understand the market and do a market assessment. You wanna understand the, the work environment, the level of satisfaction among the providers and the employees. Um, and then, <clears throat> In addition, I'd suggest you, you do a qualitative assessment, which is basically interviews. The second best governance practice is to, is to be clear about the vision um, and then define the role of the board as well as the county and the district in the role of strategy. And I'm gonna give you a suggestion that came from a December uh, 28, 2018 article in the Harvard Business Review that's on the next slide. Um, number three is to understand the roles and responsibilities of both boards. Um, where I like to see an approved job description that's reviewed annually. Um, um, annually. When I was with Stroudwater, I worked with a uh, hospital that um, was controlled, if you will, by a district and county board. We were about 30 to 45 days in the engagement, looking at strategically how we could position. And there was a level of concern um, and conflict as it relates to who makes final decisions. Um, that could have been preempted if, if we were clear about the roles and, and responsibilities. Number, number four, and I think this is the most important competence of both groups, is to have a clear and compelling communication process and plan between the two organizations, um, as well as how you're gonna move forward and communicate publicly, how you're gonna communicate in the face of a um, significant new strategy, um, an affiliation or a merger. Number five is to align both boards so they, they you share key metrics. Um, it could be financial, it could be quality, it could be patient safety. Number six is to hold the board and, and executives accountable. And what I mean 
there is that anytime you make a, a strategic decision related to um, spending capital or um, operating dollars um, that you revisit at some point, it could be the end of the year, those strategic decisions, and see how they compare um, versus your stated outcomes. Number seven is to hold strategic board meetings um, versus spending time on what I would characterize the operational minutia. And as importantly, bring those parking lot discussions back into the boardroom. Um, in my, my years working with boards of trustees and having written a book about it, sometimes those parking lot discussions are the most important and they need to be brought back into the, into the boardroom. And then finally, is, is number eight is just effectively inform and engage the county and the district. Next, I want to discuss in detail three of those eight um, best governance practices. I want to talk about the, about the board's role in strategy. And this is going to be different in every organization, every community, but I just want to share this article from uh, Roger Martin, uh, who talks about the board's role in strategy. It was in the Harvard Business Review in uh, December 28, 2018. Um, and he suggests that it's the CEO's job to formulate the strategy. However, the CEO gets maximum input and advice from the board. And he's suggesting in this article, and we have a, a PDF that we can also share with everyone on the call, is that the, the CEO first talk to the board and get input about the challenges um, the, the board is thinking about or thinks that the strategy should address. It could be as Doug talked about, um, emerging new competition, slowing growth, technology disruption. Second, in the middle of the process, the article suggests that the CEO should come back to the board um, with a range of strategic possibilities. So these are alternatives um, that, that are laid out in terms of the board challenges. And then third and final step entails the CEO presenting the desired choice to the board. Um, you got to clearly think through whether that's a retreat, um, who's invited, and I would suggest that uh, at that at the culmination of that that kind of strategic process, that the local board be involved, of course, but at a minimum, the minimum, the county or the district board be involved, um, and perhaps other members of the district and county board be involved. So let me keep going. Um, the next best practice I want to talk about is to agree upon a written job description. And this is a, um, a real example. So this is what we'll call Memorial Hospital Board of Trustees have core responsibilities. Um, and I'm going to outline those below. You can see, well, they relate to financial health, quality, and patient safety, and then down through number six. But this also clearly states that the county board has the responsibility for appointing qualified and interested trustee members through an appropriate election process. I'd suggest that you have a board job description, um, have criteria in terms of the, the kinds of people you want on the hospital board, the skill set, the breadth, the depth of knowledge. Um, but also in this case, the county board has the ultimate decision over the sale or transfer of any hospital assets. Um, and before you get into these strategic discussions, and you know this as well as me, it's important to be clear about the, about the core responsibilities. So the final best practice relates to communication. Um, and I'd suggest this is probably one of the most important competencies that both boards could have. Um, this is another real example. Um, so these are communication principles for the hospital and the district and the, and the county. This is an organization that, that um, did many of the things I just described in terms of went through a strategic planning process. We're clear about the responsibilities as it relates to merger affiliation, um, sale of the institution. And in this case, um, publicly, they, the two um, boards said that communication will be driven by the CEO and the board chair and will be reviewed by the county commissioner chair, so everybody's in alignment. It didn't say approved. This group said will be reviewed. 
Second, communications will be timely, transparent, really with the, with the thought that we need to engage the medical staff, um, other health professionals, as well as the community. The focus of the communications to the medical staff, employees, volunteers, um, community, and the identified constituents will be, will be timely. And the purpose of the communication throughout this period is to develop a positive dialogue to reinforce the sustainability um, of the hospital and the commitment to the community, to manage medical staff employee expectations, and then to strengthen the relationship with the community. At the same time, this organization said, all these efforts will continue to grow and improve our, our financial performance. Um, one of the things that they did with the organization for the organization is the CEO and the chair were the spokes people for the organization. Sometimes the county commissioner chair would be involved, um, but if a local newspaper or reporter went around um, the local board or the county board, um, they were told, here's the communication process. It's driven by the CEO and the board chair. Um, so there's no behind the scenes communication. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. Thank you uh, so much, Scott. Um, really appreciate your your comments and insights there. One of the things we wanted to make sure of um, in our conversation with all of you today is that we all have an understanding of some of the unique challenges, um, the unique nature of county and district-owned hospitals. Um, and this, by the way, depending upon the governance structure, certainly can extend to authority-owned hospitals as well. Um, some of these complexities also apply. Um, it's important to understand that, that one of the really foundational um, uh, aspects of the complexity here is that you've got, in most instances, more than one board that has oversight and governance responsibilities, uh, perhaps relating to the disposition of assets um, and um, sound operation of a facility, um, but also uh, if there's a not non-for-profit a hospital board that's leasing the facility from a, a district or a county uh, that has an obligation to the community and its charitable purposes as well. And so it's, it's clear to understand or important to understand that both boards can feel a very profound uh, fiduciary responsibility uh, and may feel that the, the other entity is not working uh, in alignment with where they want to go. And that's, that's one of the, the sources of frictions, uh, friction. Um, because the boards can be either elected or um, uh, certainly have a, a, a public uh, agenda and responsibility, um, communication and a lack of transparency can be a real um, source of friction and concern. Public conflict, um, when it, it manifests itself, can become a barrier to actually moving ahead. It can dissuade talented people from serving on the board. It can dissuade talented people from taking management or appointments on the medical staff because they, they see the turmoil and the, the chaos and, and don't want to have their professional lives and also sometimes personal lives upended by that type of, of conflict. Um, and so it's important to understand that those are real constraints. In addition, depending upon the jurisdiction, there can be legal and jurisdictional constraints in terms of whether the, the hospital or health system is actually allowed to operate in own facilities outside of the boundaries of a county, parish, or a district. Um, and in some instances, uh, should the organization face a dire financial strains, there can actually be uh, limitations or prohibitions on authority-owned hospitals um, filing for, for bankruptcy. Um, as we think about, again, these constraints, sunshine laws vary state by state. Some states have ample provisions for executive session and strategic and competitive uh, exceptions to open meeting requirements. Other states, Florida being a notable exception, have very few, if any, exemptions. And it's, it's actually um, a, a significant constraint to um, conducting business um, um, with the, the public entity. Um, tax support can sometimes hide underlying structural or operational issues. 
And so it, 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 those may be slow to manifest themselves or be realized in the, com in the community. Eroding performance um, can create a sense of anxiety, concern, and frustration among stakeholders as um, whether they be public officials or taxpayers feel that their um, exposure to those losses and operating results uh, grows over time. Um, and lastly, you know, it's the nature of the beast. If you have been founded as a uh, public entity, county owned, district owned, and may have either currently get tax support or perhaps that hasn't happened in several decades, but that legacy of community ownership and a real sense of taxpayer ownership uh, becomes a source of loyalty in the best cases and a source of division uh, in the worst cases. So as we think about uh, how to navigate some of the, the uh, potential for chaos and conflict in county and district owned hospitals, it's important to understand that, that just by the nature of the organizations and this kind of split governance model, if you will, um, that there's a higher propensity for conflict. Um, and the sources of that or the catalysts for that oftentimes are eroding hospital performance, um, reductions in hospital services, which can be one reaction to those, those financial and operational pressures, contentious medical staff or employee issues, it's not uncommon for members of the medical staff when something occurs that they're not in favor of to pick up the phone and talk to um, county commissioners or hospital board members and it can be very difficult for the hospital to conduct its business uh, if it's being second guessed and lobbied and communication is occurring that way um, with uh, stakeholders and individual board members. Um, Similar vein though, if there's a stonewall that occurs between the hospital board and perhaps inquiries from elected officials, um, that can be a source of conflict. The flip side of that is every management decision is debated and second guessed in public. Um, that can also be um, very um, disruptive. Um, the fact of the matter is that the county can have a very, and its elected officials, can have a very different risk tolerance to the, the fundamental um, uh, operating risk profile of a hospital in today's environment. And it's important to note that every organization's risk profile is dynamic and changes over time. It's, as Doug shared earlier, very challenging time in the industry, and many elected officials are nervous to have that set of risks uh, as a uh, continuing obligation of taxpayers and the county. So that becomes a, a source of potential conflict as well. Personal agendas and histories um, uh, can be a, an issue. Uh, in some instances, we've seen counties that are uh, uh, have rifts in them because of uh, decades old football rivalries uh, that have existed within the county. There's one hospital now serving the county, but there used to be two football teams and those rivalries die hard. Um, and lastly, a lack of transparency, poor communication, and those personality conflicts all can undermine the trust that's necessary for this to work. Some of the constraints on performance that county and district-owned hospitals face, one of the big ones is, unlike other not-for-profit or for-profit hospitals, you can't pick up and move and change jurisdictions. These larger systems are, are, are managing their hospitals as a portfolio and shifting investment where they, by virtue of market position or demographics or organic growth, see a, a better uh, future for um, their operations in those faster growing areas and invest less or uh, focus less on areas where that are slower growing. Many county and district owned facilities don't have that luxury. Um, mission-driven considerations that really uh, mandate and, and create a, a sense of obligation uh, and, and a, a, an important sense of obligation to continue on profitable services to continue to serve the community. Um, so in performance improvement can be limited, uh, but is essential. Ultimately, if an organization year after year has no margin, uh, it is uh, undermining its ability to fulfill its mission. And that is one of the fundamental tensions that many of you 
uh, manage in your your week to week and year to year um, responsibilities. So identification and quantification of performance improvement opportunities is important. It's an important to do that early. Uh, if think of it as changing the direction of a ship. If you do need to alter course to avoid a hurricane, it's easier to do it when the hurricane is still two or three days distant than if it's uh, in, in, imminently uh, in your path and you have to make a radical alteration or reverse course. So early identification, quantification, and action is important. Um, return on investments um, from uh, activities and initiatives to improve performance is critical. Uh, the vast majority of organizations we work with have finite resources, both in terms of capital, uh, skills, uh, and personnel, and prioritizing where you're going to spend and allocate those scarce resources is key. Um, lastly, I think understanding the right processes um, um, for sustaining performance improvement results is, is critical. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but, but it's really important to understand that every organization's risk profile is dynamic. And if the board and management doesn't have an, <clears throat> an understanding and quantification of how that risk profile is evolving year to year, um, it's possible to drift uh, into dangerous waters, if you will, to use the, uh, the ship metaphor uh, a, a, little, a little bit, uh, uh, perhaps overuse it. Um, what I wanted to do now is maybe turn it over to Kimberly um, to do, I think, our last polling question before Scott uh, brings us home. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, now, given what you've heard during the webinar and your own experience within your organization, um, we wanted to know how confident are you that you can improve your governance challenges? Um, you have it under control. You're very confident. Um, right there in the middle, moderately confident or not at all confident that you can improve your challenges. Give people a few seconds here. Right in the middle at 70% coming in hard for moderately confident. Pretty confident in the low 20s. Um, not at all confident, very much on the low side. Give you all a few more seconds, and then we'll close this out. Okay. Um, it looks like 21% are saying that they're very confident that they've got it under control. 75% say there is some wiggle room there to do better, and only 4% say they're not at all confident. Uh, after that, I believe we go back to Scott. So hopefully you can use some of the suggestions that, uh, that you heard today. So next I want to talk about some best practices. And Jeff, you may want to go to the next slide. So the next slide, thank you, um, talks about the top six best practices. I'm going to just quickly go through the, through the categories because we want to open it up for, for questions and some of these um, things we had mentioned earlier. So the, 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 the first thing you want to do in terms of mitigating conflict is um, board education and stakeholder education, making sure that, that uh, both parties, if you will, understand some of the national, regional, and market forces. They understand some of the, some of the, the risk. And it also gives both, uh, both boards um, a great opportunity to sit down, get together in a more informal kind of uh, setting. Um, second is to develop a common fact base. I talked about the need for both a qualitative and quantitative um, assessment, whether that's a market assessment or a cultural assessment. And again, that's that's one thing that Stroudwater does very well. Two is if you're begin at the beginning stages of a, a new strategy, um, maybe beginning to talk about the organiza organizations, preferred future, um, you may want to put together a, a joint task force um, that can understand um, the pressures, the emerging trends, the marketplace, um, build or in some cases rebuild the working relationship and the, and the trust. And that's a good way of seeking consensus before you're actually looking at merger, consolidation, affiliation, or whatever your unique strategy may, 
may be. The next one we talked about in terms of engaging both boards around a shared vision. Um, I talked about the importance of a communication strategy, developing key messages, um, also clarifying who are going to be the spokespeople under certain circumstances. And then, as I talked about some board fundamentals and best practices, um, just remember the, the sound governance. So my, my advice is, as you think about these things in your unique situation, uh, be proactive and get ahead of your most pressing governance issues, because I will, I, I will tell you, while there aren't many county and district hospitals in the United States, you're absolutely critical to the United States infrastructure and backbone for caring for whether it's critical access patients, um, county patients, or within your district, there's an absolute need for you to be successful. So I want to thank my colleagues and Stroudwater, and with that, I'll open it up for questions. All right. Um, thank you, Scott. We have um, a few questions. I'm going to ask the one that's the most broad because I think that will touch on myriad topics um, across the audience. Um, so say you have 14 different communications challenges in your organization and you're really looking to get kind of an early win to prove that you can address the issues. Um, where, where should people start? Um, Scott, I don't know if that would be a good question for you. Uh, it sounds like there are a lot of communi um, many communications um, issues in this organization. I, um, I typically begin, and this may not be the right answer for everybody, is I typically begin with the, the CEO and the chairs of both um, the local hospital board as well as the county and district. Um, first, to understand the, the issues that both may be facing, what's the best communication process, and then I always like to bring in um, the the, um, the marketing professional within the organization or the public relations professional within the organization. And once there's some agreement at that level in terms of the priority communication issues, how you're going to communicate, it's just as important as, as sharing that plan um, in a very detailed and um, important way with, with the local hospital board as well as the the district. Um, you also set ground rules in terms of who's going to speak publicly. So that way you avoid, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the runaround. And the runaround could be um, somebody from either one of the boards or somebody from within the medical staff leadership. Now, you can't always preempt that. But again, I would start with the, uh, with the CEO and the two board chairs as well as the local marketing and public relations professional. And again, Jeff and Doug may want to add to that. Scott, I, I, I would agree. And the thing I would emphasize around some of these communication issues, if there's public debate and dissension and conflict, um, the, the key thing to addressing that is obviously the communication strategy, but it is important to get those key leaders working together and communicating themselves. That if you can... Um, get the leadership of the respect of the organization and the respective boards to start working together. So, um, you know, the key deliverable being, um, you know, what is a common vision that we're all committed to achieving? Uh, and then hopefully getting a common fact base so that everybody has the same understanding of the, the constraints and the needs and the opportunities. Um, but, but that immediate communication issue needs to be addressed and, developing some sort of a, a, a work group um, where folks internally at the most senior level are communicating and developing those working relationships uh, and rebuilding some of that muscle memory to be effective, I think is a, a really also key point. Doug in Nashville, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, you know, I agree with, 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 with what Jeff and, and, and Scott have both shared with us. Um, so we had, you know, we had a really interesting sort of real life experience not long ago. Jeff and Scott and I in it with a southeast area hospital that had a, um, had, had three layers. It had a a district authority board. Uh, it had a hospital 
501c3 board, and then it also had a very influential foundation board. Um, and historically, there had been a lot of rock throwing between the between the district board and the the foundation and hospital board, and lots of things played out in the newspaper. Um, but when they did finally uh, convene, uh, you know, it's, Scott just talked about the six best practices, and they did number two, number three, and number four especially well. Um, they convened a task force of the leadership of each of those boards. They developed a common fact base and, and, and developed a shared vision around what they wanted to accomplish. Once they had done that, then, it, then they were able to implement a communication strategy that became very effective. Um, and you no longer had the Hatfields and the McCoys uh, throwing rocks at each other in the newspaper. Uh, but you but you had an organization that moved forward on a very strategic initiative that had a good that had a good outcome. That's a great example, Doug. And and the the me metaphor I would use is if you can drain the emotion um, and and somehow um, contain the distrust and start to uh, build working relationships via some of those techniques. Um, it's, it's amazing what's possible. Um, the flip side of, of that example, and I think uh, Doug's choice is a, a really good one, is we've, we've worked in communities where, um, you know, we've been engaged solely by one board. And um, it, 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 if, if numbers two, three, and four, or one through four, aren't done, um, it, it becomes not impossible, but certainly much more difficult to achieve the organization's strategic objectives, just because you're constantly refighting um, the, and relitigating decisions and and facing um, that conflict and chaos. Um, so, really thinking about those six uh, strategies or techniques uh, is is critical, I think, for long-term success. All right. Well, with that, um, I think we have the opportunity to give everyone about five minutes back to their day. Um, at the end of the presentation, you'll see um, Jeff, Doug, and Scott's direct contact information. Please feel free to reach out to any of us here. Um, and on behalf of Stroudwater in Portland, Maine, and Atlanta and Nashville, I thank you so much for sharing part of your day with us. I will be sending out the recording and the materials within the next 24 to 36 hours. Thank you and have a great day.